outro. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been. And am. But will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all, was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how the idea first entered my brain, but once conceived it, it haunted me, day and night. Objects there were none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me, never given me insult for his gold. I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale blue eye with film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid me of the eye forever. Now this is the point you fan fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than the week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and I opened it and oh, so gently, and then I made an opening sufficient for my head. I put in a dark lantern all closed, closed so that no light shone out, and I thrust in my head, and you would have laughed at how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him lay upon his bed. Would a madman been so wise as this? And then this is when my head was well in the room. I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, <laughs> so cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by his name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have to be a profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my powers of my sagacity. I could hardly contain the feeling of triumph to think there I was opening the door little by little and he not even to dream of the secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea. And perhaps he heard me, for he moved on his bed suddenly as if startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was black as pitch with thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened through fear of burnt robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening for the door and kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had 
my hand and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tim fastening and the old man sprang in bed crying out, who is there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle. In the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting in bed, listening just as I had done before, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan and knew it was the groan of mortal terror, not the groan of pain or grief. Oh no! It was a low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it was welled up in my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo. The terrors that distracted me, I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and I pitied him. Although I chuckled at heart, I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he turned in the bed, his fears ever since growing upon him, him trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or it is merely a cricket that made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with all these suspicions, but he had found it all in vain. All in vain because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim and it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although never saw nor heard me, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily Stealthily, stealthily. Until a length, a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled my very marrow in my bones but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely on the damned spot. And now, have I not told you what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses? Now, I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes. But I knew that sound too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of the drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instance. The old man's terror must have been extreme. I say louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, such a strange noise as this excited me neighbor, an old man. He shrieked once, only once, in an instant 
I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then sat upon the bed and smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the walls. At length it ceased and the old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. And his eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head, the arms, the legs, and then I took three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. The tub had caught all of that. When I had made an end to these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what have I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavite as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by the neighbor during the night, and suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged to the police, and they, the officers, had been sent to search the premises. I smiled, but what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome the shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasure secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigue while I myself in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph placed my own seat upon the very spot which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things, but ere long I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing was more distinct. It continued to become more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I rose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulation, but the noise increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with a heavy stride, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise rose over all, continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they heard, they suspected, they knew they were making a mockery of my horror. 
this I thought, this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could, I could bear those hypocritical smiles no more. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark. Louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble me no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here it is the beating of the hideous heart.